A warm welcome to one and all for the inaugural function of the Earth Science Week 2021. This series of talks is being organized by Maharashtra Buksha Samvardhini Pune, jointly with Ferguson College Autonomous Pune, Navroji Vadia College Pune, and School of Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences, Goa University. Since October 1998, the American Geosciences Institute has organized Earth Science Week, a national and international event to help the public gain a better understanding and appreciation for the Earth Sciences and to encourage stewardship of the Earth. This year's Earth Science Week is being held from October 10th to 16th, 2021. Even though Earth constitutes only a small part of the billions of objects within the universe, it is still a wonderfully strange and mysterious place, a continually moving and changing planet that is offering up weird and wonderful things every day. Without doubt, some of these may be things that we are seeing for the first time and more still may yet to be totally hidden from us. Who knows how many mysteries remain to be discovered and understood. The theme of the lectures of this year's Earth Science Week is geological wonders. They cover a range of topics, including a broad overview of geological mysteries, unusual gems and minerals, the secrets of Antarctica, the frozen continent that is slowly releasing its hidden treasures, the story of black gold, or what is commonly known to us as petroleum, the dramatic tale of dinosaurs, the magnificent creatures that have captured the imagination of people, especially children all over the world, and which roamed the earth millions of years ago before being completely wiped out rather quickly. And finally, the truly incredible phenomenon of the drifting of continents, a process that has given us the shape of the continents and their positions on the globe as we know it today. Each is a fascinating and wondrous topic in itself. The speakers who will be telling us about these mysteries and wonders are all experts in their fields and we are indeed privileged and honored to have them join us for this series. We sincerely thank them for their willingness to share their enthusiasm for the subject with us. Education is a cornerstone of the organizations sponsoring this series of presentations. To that end, we hope that the presentations this week will trigger the imagination of youngsters and spur at least some of them into pursuing a vocation into the wonders of the earth. There are so many mysteries yet to be discovered and with all the technological advances being developed in the supporting of sciences, the field of earth science is waiting to be unlocked. Opportunities are plentiful. Only needed are curiosity and a desire to explore. Thank you. Uh, now I request Professor Atul Joshi, Head, Department of Geology, MS University, Baroda, to introduce Dr. Shailesh Nayak, sir, who is going to in inaugurate this Earth Science Week 2021. Professor Atul Joshi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vatak. And uh, uh, good morning to all. It gives me an immense pleasure and pride to introduce uh, Dr. Shailesh Nayak, sir, who is an alumni of our department. And a brief uh, you know, curriculum vitae of uh, Dr. Nayak, I'll introduce to him. Dr. Shailesh Nayak is the director, National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bengaluru, and Chancellor, Terry University of Advanced Studies, New Delhi. He obtained his PhD degree in geology from the MS University of Baroda in 1980. He was the secretary, Ministry of Earth Sciences, and chaired Earth System Science Organization during 2008 to 2015. He had set up the state-of-the-art tsunami warning system for the Indian Ocean and developed marine sciences during his tenure in the SO Indian National Center for Ocean Services, Hyderabad. He had joined ISRO in 1978 and pioneered applications of remote sensing to coastal and marine environments and developed products for coastal management and services, for fisheries and ocean state forecast. He is a fellow of Indian Academy of Sciences, Indian National Science Academy, National Academy of Sciences, India, the International Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, and 
academician of the International Academy of Astronautics. He was conferred the ISC Vikram Sarabhai Memorial Award in 2012. He has published about 200 papers in scientific journals. I, I welcome Dr. Nayak. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Atul, for very generous introduction. Uh, Professor Lips, uh, Dr. Rajiv, Dr. Atul, and all the participants. I'm really very happy to participate in this uh, Earth Science Week uh, 2021. I think it's a very novel, novel idea, and uh, I think it is necessary that the Earth Science has to be celebrated in this manner. I think the earth science is the science of a very national importance. The scientific understanding of the earth system helps us to improve the prediction of climate, weather, natural hazards, as well as it leads to affordable and sustainable living and use of natural resources. During last 15 years or so in India, there has been major improvements in weather, climate and monsoon forecasting, predictions of hazards such as tsunami and cyclones, sustainable use of fishery resources and exploring mineral and energy resources for the development. At present, the world and India are facing challenges related to sustainability of humanity and ecosystem of our planet. We need to implement a system to understand the cause and consequences of interaction of earth processes and anthropogenic activities, as well as use and management of natural and energy resources. In my view, there are five major areas which earth science community should be addressing in coming years. And many of this, I'm sure that this week would be addressed. The first, I think, is the understanding of the past climate changes and interactions of climate with landscapes, ecosystem, and human activities of past is a critical aspect of understanding and predicting future climate challenges. The changes which occurred during Holocene when civilization grew and lost are most vital. The understanding of responses of fauna, flora, hydrological and ecological conditions of past climate and use of this insight in predicting future response is of great necessity. The observing networks of atmosphere, hydrosphere, geosphere, cryosphere and biosphere will have to be strengthened to increase our capability to generate outputs from predictive and empirical models. Such outputs will help to develop strategies for reduction of risk and improve the potential of hydrological and ecological system to be self-sustained. Resilient and adaptable to climate change and their impacts. The future projections developed by Earth System Science Organization in the Institute of Tropical Meteorology in Pune related to the changes in monsoon patterns, droughts, sea level rise, ocean warming, cyclones, and Himalayan systems are needed to be translated into policy directions. Such effort will help in strengthening response to the climate change. The second issue is the availability of a water, which is likely to be a major concern in India and world over. With increasing population, availability of water is reducing per capita. In view of climate change, we have been witnessing increase in extreme rainfall and decrease in low and moderate events leading to changes in the water cycle. There is a need to understand how these changes are going to affect shallow groundwater table. Shallow groundwater table supports the terrestrial ecosystem and base flow in the rivers. We need to understand how changing climate, terrain, and sea level can affect the shallow groundwater, and we should model the same. Second, in the Northwest India, the Indus Basin provide water for food crops 
and sustaining human life. The Indus Basin depends mainly on snow and ice melt for water, which is likely to change. The recent uh, report says that the snowfall in this region is decreasing. This kind of a variability of a snowfall consequent to climate change need to be modeled and efficient forecast system needs to be developed. In view of the changing water cycle, a comprehensive accounting of spatial and temporal availability of fresh water, both in quantity and quality for local and regional needs to be developed. Such systems should assess needs of human as well as for the terrestrial ecosystem and biota. The third, the potential risk from the natural hazards such as earthquake, floods, landslide, tsunami, coastal erosion, forest fires, cyclones must be continuously evaluated and communicated to governments and communities. The impact of climate change and variability on frequency and intensity of natural hazard must be addressed. The understanding of hazard generating processes, their distribution, timing, severity, and their impact on terrain, settlements, and human security are critical, assess, critical for assessing the societal vulnerabilities. In this regard, earthquakes, landslides, and avalanches are most critical as predictive capabilities are yet to be developed. Improvement in forecasting probabilities and assessment of long-term strain rates in Himalaya and other earthquake-prone areas may facilitate probabilistic forecasting of large earthquakes in Uttarakhand, Himachal Pradesh, and Northeast India. Intense efforts are required to achieve this goal. The other issue, the Himalaya is losing almost 4 billion tons of ice every year. In view of that, the understanding of solid earth processes to deformation associated with the glaciology isostatic adjustment need to be developed. At present, limited efforts have been made in this direction. Lastly, it is essential to have in-depth assession, assessment of structure and composition of Indian lithosphere. Development of seismic tomographic models, starting with Himalayan terrain, for understanding structure of lithosphere, along with the measurement of strain through GPS and SAR interferometry, supported by gravity and magnetic data, should be taken up. The fourth issue, the energy and minerals, and India is one of the largest consumer of fossil fuel. However, indigenous production is less than 30% of requirement. Gas hydrates, ice-like crystalline form of methane and water are considered as a major future hydrocarbon energy resource and occurs in shallow sediments along the continental margins of India, where water depth is more than 500 meters. The volume of methane gas in deep ocean located gas hydrate reservoirs of India is likely to be 1900 tera cubic meter. Efforts are to be enhanced for understanding the formation of gas hydrate as well as development of harnessing technology for this. The assessment of energy resources such as gas hydrate, shell gas, geothermal and other renewable energy resources, vis-a-vis -vis consequences of using fossil fuels and their impact on atmospheric carbon dioxide levels, land use changes and atmospheric pollution has to be carried out. Research efforts are to be enhanced to study the carbon cycle, especially the terrestrial carbon cycle and carbon sequestration of the earth system. The rare metals such as cobalt, which are replication in high-tech industries, resources for which are scarce. Cobalt is mostly associated with copper, nickel, and arsenic. Efforts are required to intensify exploration both on land and in sea. Such exploration did not limit to Indian mass and waters, but also in high seas, Arctic, and other friendly countries. The understanding of complete life cycle of materials, including plastics, its occurrence, extraction, use, and waste disposal, and their impact on environment and economy will help to understand the influence of landscape, 
hydrology, climate, ecosystem, and human health. The last three, the distribution and health of various ecosystems, their components, functions, and dynamics should be understood for conservation, preservation, and management of vital and critical ecosystems. There will be a need to expand the observing system, including satellite and aerial system, for collecting biological, biophysical, and biochemical measurements to monitor and observe changes vis-a-vis -vis environmental changes. The census of marine life and ocean biogeographical information system are good examples. The predictive modeling efforts are required in, to be enhanced in the view of impact of climate change. I'd like to conclude with the, that there are already investments made in this region, but they are not sufficient. The full implementation of these five strategic areas will need additional funding and human resources. The benefit to the nation will be substantial compared to the investment made in these activities. The sustainable development of any country or a region requires not only the understanding of the earth system processes and resources, but also the communicating their impact to society so that natural resources are effectively managed and thresholds are not crossed to avoid irreversible changes leading to disasters. With these few words, I am very happy to inaugurate this Earth Science Week. I wish all the best to the presentations and the party. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nayak. With that uh, introduction to environment and uh, today's topic of uh, Earth Science Week, uh, let us go further. I will ask Dr. Ajit Vartak to introduce Professor Jalelix. It is my great honor to introduce today's guest speaker, renowned earth scientist, Professor Jerry Lips. Professor Jerry Lips did his doctorate from University of California, Los Angeles. Then he was leader of two projects on Antarctic marine ecology for United States Antarctic program between 1971 to 1981. As a result of his research, Antarctic Board of Geographic placed names in 1979 named an island after him in Antarctic called Lips Island. His research mainly concerns with paleontology, evolutionary biology, and ecology of modern and marine organisms from places around the world. Presently, he is a professor, professor emeritus of the Graduate School, University of California, Berkeley, and curator of paleontology at the University of California Museum of Paleontology. He has published more than 500 research papers and articles and authored many books. He has been visiting professor in Oxford University, University of Georgia, University of Tübingen, Arthras University, Paleontological Institutes, etc. He has been visiting scientists in Natural History Museum at Washington, D.C., as well as at London. He served on NASA's Planetary Protection Committee. He is a full fellow of many prestigious institutions like Shell Foundation, Cushman Foundation, Geological Society of America, California Academy of Sciences. One foraminifera genus, Lipsina, and one species, Concris Lipsi, are named in his honor. He is a living inspiration to all of us as he continues to work on his research, his papers, and articles at the age of 82. With this short introduction, now I request Professor Lips to give his. Uh, there will be. Uh, there will be no question answer during the presentation. After the presentation is over, you can ask the questions in a chat mode. Later on, we'll be sharing uh, the email address of uh, Lipser so that you can directly communicate with Lipser uh, if you have any questions. We'll be taking limited questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ajit. Uh, I also uh, want appreciate the very wise words of Professor Yak about uh, the geological problems and opportunities that exist in the world and particularly in India. It's a wonderful way to start Earth Science Week for you. I'd like to thank uh, him, Ajit Bartak, Missions Devrai, 
and the audience. I'm very happy to be talking to you from California at, uh, let me check, 9.55 in the evening. <laughs> let me just clarify my background a little bit. I have a PhD in geology from uh, UCLA in 1965, uh, but I also took a lot of marine biology and paleontology. So those are the three areas that I've dealt with. The geology comes from California and Siberia and faultine and archaeology, geoarchaeology, marine biology in Antarctica, the Pacific reefs, looking at history of <coughs> evolution and extinctions uh, with paleontology. And also under biology is astrobiology, where I looked at the possibility of life on Mars, which we'll talk about a little bit later here and Europa, which is behind me here. In all of this, I've had many, many mysteries in geology. You know about a lot of them. They're all over the place, and some of them are taken quite seriously. If you think about them from the knowledge of a geologist or paleontologist or biologist, you can think of them as fun ideas. They are interesting because they reveal something about the people who are promoting those mysteries. They're not really mysteries. So we'll see all of this here in a few, mo in a few moments. So what I'd like to talk to you about are things that are geological mysteries, as I said, some of them are more biological than uh, geological, but mysteries indeed they are. Uh, there's my email address. I think it appears on the last slide as well. Simple, jlips at berkeley.edu will reach me almost immediately. So what do we know about these? Um, if we look at their geological mysteries, we can see that they're of three different kinds, really. They're simply mistakes in understanding put often forth by people that don't have a background in the particular problem. There are intentional misinformation, for example, writing books about some of these mysteries, like the pyramids or uh, cities on Mars, or simply confusion about complex geological problems. And geology can be very complex, especially if there's not very much data. So that this is a big problem when it comes to these geological mysteries. Um, but once we take a look at them closely, using geology or biology or science in general, we can see that they're not so mystical. They can be fun, they can be interesting, but truth shows they're really not mysteries. So what I'd like to talk to you today about are bloody lakes, sailing stones, the stones of the Egyptian and some other pyramids, and the cities of Mars. All of these have geological implications and have been uh, promoted by people thinking about the various things that we'll talk about in a totally incorrect way. So let's start with bloody lakes. Oh no, that's a Bloody Mary. Uh, so we see bloody lakes rivers and seashores very often in nature. And they are said to be mysteries. We see them on television programs. Sometimes they're pitched as uh, some kind of horrible thing that's coming to get us, anything to get our attention that seems bad. But the real truth of the matter is not anything at all like that. So there are these bloody appearing lakes Here's a bloody appearing uh, tide, a red tide. And we know that these are actually formed by different kinds of algae. In particular, the red tides are formed by these dinoflagellates shown in this image on the right, and a whole list of other kinds of algae. And there's some bacteria that will do this as well. 
and they get blooming in the water when there's certain kinds of nutrients and it turns the water red. We see this in a variety of different places, lakes, as I said, some rivers, uh, very often in near shore environments. We have them in the South Bay of San Francisco Bay where uh, salt pans turn bloody in appearance. And of course, it always fascinates people to see it and they wonder what it is. And they think, oh, well, uh, you know, if it's not blood, maybe it's rust. And certainly that's a possibility. However, most people don't think about these microorganisms that actually are the result resulting in the red color that they term bloody. So that mystery is rather simple, but you need a microscope. You need some understanding about biology and about uh, nutrient supply that promotes these kinds of bursts of populations of all these microalgae. And then there's the saline stones of Death Valley. These are stones that appear on a dry lake bed right next to Death Valley. And they are obviously moved across this lake bed and it's been a wonder to many people about how this happened. This mystery is not, has not made the public uh, market as much as it has the geological literature. So geologists have been mystified by this and there's been a number of hypotheses. So that lake bed is called the racetrack because it looks like these rocks raced across the bed and it's located near Death Valley, which is at the location of that arrow in California. And there's Los Angeles and San Francisco, Baja California and Mexico. So this is most of uh, the United States. If we take a closer look at it, here's the racetrack lake. And you can see that there are high mountains along one side and the other side, it's in a valley. It's a dry lake bed, and you can see the same thing over here in Death Valley. This is a dry lake bed as well. It gets wet when there is precipitation, but that's very rare. Temperatures in Death Valley here this last year were up to 128 degrees Fahrenheit. Perhaps you can do the conversion. You can see down here uh, this little dark spot is a patch of water called bad water. So we'll take a look at the racetrack and try to figure out the mystery of the saline stones. So this is what they look like. You can see that they have come from the mountain range and sailed across the lake bed and obviously plowed up some of the sediment. So how did they get there in that fashion? That's the question. So the, there are at least th six hypotheses. These have been studied and we now know the truth of this. So the first possibility is that gravity has slid them across the lake, maybe rolling down the mountains and then uh, across the lake, but they're not rounded. They're always angular because they are big pieces of alluvium from the, ages, from the edges of the mountains. Uh, not having much knowledge about this, but having perhaps observed them, some people have proposed that the aliens move them about. This is quite common in California for some reason. We always think about aliens doing everything. Uh, UFOs, they're, you know, aliens capture people and take them up into their uh, spacecraft and experiment on them. Uh, so it's not an extreme suggestion that aliens move these around, given that background. In fact, just over in Nevada, right next to this area, there is the alien highway uh, near Roswell in New Mexico. Still further over are a whole museum of aliens. So Americans believe in UFOs and aliens. About 60% of Americans believe that. They are true. 
and that they move these stones. A more geological idea is that water pushed them, and that makes some sense. Water moving in a certain direction might push them, but when you look at the trails, the trails are not consistent. We'll see that in a moment. Another one is that the wind caught the edges of the rock when it was when the mud on the lake bed was just slippery and blew them. Another hypothesis was that ice moved them. But the truth of the matter is, after detailed study and putting GPS units on the uh, rocks, they discovered that when in the winter time, water gets in place on the lake bed, it turns into a sheet of very thin ice and the thin ice wraps around the stone. And then when the bl wind blows the ice, not the rock, when it blows the ice, the ice drags the rock to make the saline rocks of Death Valley. They're not saline at all. They are slipping along with ice pulling them and wind blowing the ice. And here we can see after a, an example that happened after an icy episode, and you can see how the tracks of each stone show the movement of the ice. And so it was a big sheet of ice that started like this, and then it went like that, and some of the stones stayed with it. You can see the stones at the trails. Here's one that started way down here. You can see this one, it swung around like all the others, and then there's the stone out there. So it's a little more complicated than what geologists thought originally, and it took some people, uh, some high-tech stuff with the GPS units and tracking devices, and then they were able to go out at a particular time to test the hypotheses of ice. They did not anticipate exactly how that system would work, but they got that correct. So that was a geological mystery, even for geologists for a while and a great place to go. Another mystery, of course, are the mystery of the pyramids. Lots of mysteries with pyramids. They are said to be uh, psychologically important to people, and I can understand that, that they have some special powers over people. I can sort of understand why people might feel one way or another in front of these objects and that uh, they're mysterious because they don't know how they were built. So that's what I wanna take a look at. How were the stones of the Egyptian pyramids and other places, which I'll just mention briefly, how were they uh, built and how were the stones moved? So it's not just pyramids. Here's some other places in uh, Egypt, where there are huge stones, you can see the people down in this picture, and a huge pile of big stones, all to make this column. And if people were standing over here next to these statues, they would come up to maybe there. So these, again, are huge, huge stones. And this one is particularly large, too. So it's not just the pyramids of Egypt that are uh, play a role in this, but how did people deal with all of these different things? So when we look at the pyramids up close, we can see that there are blocks of uh, limestone. These are Eocene limestones. Here I am for scale. And those limestones are built mainly of a foraminiferin called pneumulites. And it's called pneumulites because they're round like coins. So you can see them on a bedding plane here in the stone. And here's the edge view of that stone with all the pneumulites in cross section. And those pneumulites lived in a shallow sea. These were organisms, single-celled organisms that contained symbionts that allowed the symbionts photosynthesized and that symbiotic relationship we call it photosymbiosis, uh, allowed the pneumulites to grow large 
and to not compete necessarily with one another for food. So they could just grow in massive amounts in this Eocene period that lasted for a few million years to build these limestone blocks or limestone beds that the blocks are cut from uh, all over the Middle East, really. So you can see where they cut these blocks. Here they cut them out here, and here's the edge of the pyramid. So some of the blocks were moved just a short distance. Over here, you can see other areas where the blocks were quarried and then moved onto the pyramids. These are not the only pyramids in the world, of course. Whoops. There are other ones in uh, Mexico, in um, Peru, by completely different people. So how did they manage to build with these stones? People power. They just had lots and lots of people all working to pull these blocks up the edge of the uh, pyramid, perhaps with uh, logs for rolling the stones on them and also for ramping up the pyramid. And we see the same thing happening in Mexico and other places where pyramids are built or with the big stone heads at Easter Island. The same thing, it's people power. You don't need mysterious aliens to build pyramids. With a lot of people, you can do it. So that's the answer to that mystery. They have power, but it's only in your imagination. So let's take a look then at the last example, the cities of Mars. And we look at this, in, this uh, old picture drawn back in the early 1900s of the canals on Mars. And these canals, were said to be built by aliens living on Mars or Martians. And these connecting points would be communities or cities or groups. And then these would be the trackways and roads of where the aliens moved about on Mars. Of course, we know that's not true now. However, it makes a good story. And that story is repeated, at least in California, almost daily about aliens, that is. As I said, 60% of Americans, maybe a higher percent of Californians think that people, uh, not people, things like this, aliens are out there in their UFO spaceships. They forget that UFO means unidentified flying object. Doesn't mean it's an alien spaceship, but that, UFO has come to mean that to Americans. So we're all a little nuts. But this is the fun part of all these mysteries, of course. You could take those diagrams of Mars that were done in the early periods of time, and Orson Welles did that with his uh, original soundtrack where he scared half of the United States with the idea of a war of the worlds where he related a, as though he were a, observing it, an invasion of aliens from Mars. And then there's been two or three different um, make, remakes of the movie, The War of the Worlds. It's a lot of fun, but there's not any evidence that that's true. So what is the situation? Well, this picture taken in 1977, when viewed by the director of the Viking mission that took this, the director said, oh my God, a face on Mars. And that, of course, is what everybody sees on this image. Is it a face? Is there a bunch of pyramids? These have been called pyramids and these little knobs here and there. But let me point out all these black dots. Those are not bugs or people running around. Those are blank pixels. So no image was recorded in these blank spots. And of course, it enhances those pixels, blank pixels, enhance the 
image here of this face on Mars. And it enhances a few other features. Uh, the, this feature that shows like the mouth and then the nose is enhanced by these uh, dark pixels. And when you look around on the surface of Mars, you can see other features like impact craters where asteroids and meteorites have struck the surface billions of years ago. So in other places on Mars, we see tracks and traces of water flowing. And again, that's probably at least three and a half billion years old. So Mars now is very dry. Its average surface temperature is 60 degrees C. Uh, the atmosphere is 100th at the uh, pressure of the atmosphere of Earth. And the radiation load is terrible, very, very high. You'd have to be one tough alien to live there. If you were a spacecraft from Mars going from Earth, you would have a real problem with radiation to say nothing of the temperature and everything else. Although we're going to send somebody there one of these days. So let's take another look. Here's the 1976-77 Viking 1 image that resulted in the face on Mars. And that resolution was 40 meters per pixel. Mars Global Survey in 1998, about 20 years later, the resolution was 4.3 meters per pixel. So now we can look at the face here and see that there is no, first of all, no loss of pixels. Second, that you can begin to see topographic features that have no resemblance to this rough image. Although you can see where the eyes would have been. Here's the uh, mouth, the nose right there. And then this is another image at the same resolution, 4.3 meters per pixel, but with a different, uh, light <coughs> reflection. And you can see there again, this little valley or whatever it is uh, for the mouth, the nose there, and then the eyes on either side. So there's no evidence of cities on Mars. There's no evidence that aliens ever lived on Mars. And if they did, they're pretty tough little buggers, I guess. We don't know if there are any. We've been looking at Mars up close ever since Viking, and we've never seen anything moving. We've never seen anything big that would be an organism. And we now have um, a mission at Mars that's actually studying rocks to find fossils. That's wonderful for us paleontologists that we will have a chance maybe to find fossilized remains on Mars. The only problem is that the the mission with its helicopter has now taken two or three cores and they store those cores in another device that they will send back to Earth in 2031. So we have a 10 year wait to get those specimens back just to start understanding them. It's exciting, but it's no mystery. Here's another mystery. This picture on the left was sent to me uh, by the people that were looking at Opportunity Lander. It landed and then it took this picture and the people working on it in NASA offices and laboratories thought it looked like a crinoid, which is an organism shown here, a fossil crinoid. And they thought that this part of the crinoid expanded here was this thing. But if you look very carefully at this so-called crinoid, you can see that the, the uh, columnals, these are called columnals, these little pieces, they're round disks that make up the stems of the crinoid. Those are actually cracks and the cracks extend back into the rock behind it. So this is some kind of weathering phenomenon. It doesn't represent a fossil, although it's sure a lot of fun to uh, debate it with those people. They accepted that too. Yeah. 
So that's not a fossil. So here's another one that was discovered in an, a Martian meteorite. You've probably heard about this one. These are little tiny um, objects. They're hundredth the size of a normal size bacterium. Uh, they are too small to even to hold a DNA molecule. And if you look around it, this one looks like a perfect little wormy thing or bacterium. But if you look around it, you can see other things that if they were lined up in a row like these are, that you might think that too. So this is really a mineralogical uh, depositional kind of thing on this meteorite, which was transported from the surface of Mars by an impact and then floated around the solar system for millions of years before it landed on Earth in Antarctica. And then they were able to uh, do some sections and breaking the rock apart and then scanning it with a scanning electron microscope. But it's not a fossil. It's a mineral of some sort. But that's another fun mystery. But no longer. So these kinds of things are a lot of fun, as I said. And Darwin tried to deal with this. Let me just uh, move my... Excuse me. Let me get rid of that. There we go. Uh, so Darwin had a this saying that he published in The Descent of Man in 1871. And it's something to keep in mind when we do any kind of geology. And it's a good way to look at these mysteries that we've been talking about. So he says, false facts are highly injur injurious to the progress of science, for they often endure long. But false views, if supported by some evidence, do little harm, for everyone takes a salutary pleasure in proving their falseness. And when this is done, one path towards error is closed, and the road to truth is often at the same time opened. And that's exactly what these mysteries of geology have done for us. We closed one path, that is the mystery, and we took the road to truth. And we now understand what all of these mysteries, plus a lot more mysteries that we have in science and in life in general are. We should all keep this in mind, that writing something that's wrong often does more for helping science than it does in detracting from it. Not that I recommend being wrong, but alternate hypotheses are important way to do our science and an important way for the general people of the world to think about things. If they could think about things like the items that Professor Nayak had talked about. So, This is my student's um, face on Mars. He took my picture. She took my picture and put it on Mars. That too is not really a mystery. But thank you very much for your attention. I'm glad I was able to be here with you on this first day of Earth Science Week. Thank you, Professor Lips. Very interesting and informative talk. Now I think we'll go to a question answer session. Uh, Sunil, question, Ida Bhaktu. Uh, Ajit, may I just uh, come in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can. Uh... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Professor Lips, this was really fascinating uh, account of the <laughs> various things, and I'm sure uh, you have uh, ignited many young minds uh, to look at some of those things. And uh, I must compliment you for a very lucid way you. Uh, explain this, some of these mysteries. Uh, I have one small uh, question. Of course, you're not included uh, in your talk, but uh, what do you think about the current uh, race, which is this for lunar uh, moon? 
And uh, what do you think the major reason for all space powers now uh, going to moon and uh, trying to set up their stations there? Um, you know, I missed some of, uh, I, I didn't hear some of the uh, question. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, oh, I'm saying that uh, the last uh, decade or two, you know, most yes. space powers have started their journey to moon again. And uh, what in your opinion that for what purpose this uh, missions are being taken and how it is going to change our life in future? You mean the missions that are going to the moon and places moon, like yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. and probably you're thinking of Elon Musk's and uh, the yeah. other guy. Uh, well, those are very are not going very far to begin with. So far, they're not even <laughs> out of the atmosphere. They're close to it, but not completely <laughs> out. And so they're more like a big, uh, for one of them, just a big circular uh, route up and back down, parabolic, oh. I should say. And the other one went around the Earth, what, 50 times or 15 times? I forgot. And the real problem for humans to go into outer space is radiation. You can't, until we solve the problem of radiation, uh, we're going to be in a, a difficult situation because, okay. uh, and at the moment, we don't have any way to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's an interesting question. And um, whenever they go to Mars, it's going to be a, uh, probably long after many of us are dead and that's including me. And that's one of the regrets I have about dying is that I'm going to miss out on a lot of really interesting things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Jerry, can, can you put again your email ID on the screen? There you go. Yes. Down at the bottom here. Yeah. So that's J lips at Berkeley. B E R K E L E Y dot E D U. I'd be happy to uh, answer your questions. I also go, I'm also on Facebook and we could carry out discussions there too. The most fascinating thing you heard in geology. Oh my, that's a good question. The most fascinating thing. There's so many things, my goodness. Um, well, I think, I think some things have been more fascinating at one time in my life than other times. For example, uh, plate tectonics. I was absolutely taken by that as a graduate student when it first came out, but now I don't think about it too much. And then when they discovered the organisms that were living on the uh, hydrothermal vents at the center of spreading ridges. I thought that was, that was absolutely incredible too. Uh, although not as significant as some people thought that that's where life might, may have evolved or that these organisms living there had undergone some special kind of evolution. They really are all related to things that live in much shallower water anyway. So that uniqueness disappeared after a while. And I guess that's what intrigues me for a while are the uniqueness of these different things. And you can go out in the world and find something I do anyway that turns me on almost anywhere in the world. There is one more interesting question. What is the thing you enjoy most in geology? <laughs> I think uh, almost anything I'm doing at the, the particular time. So I have done all kinds of different things. I've given uh, long lectures on faulting in California, for example. I live within 500 meters of the Hayward Fault, which is said to be the most dangerous fault in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I'm fascinated by that every time I drive down the hill that I live on. Um, I was fascinated by rocks that 
the Native Americans here turned into uh, things that looked like cogstones and nobody knew how they were made or why they were made. So we got involved by looking at the, where did the rock types come from that they used? That was fascinating for a while. And I think the uh, origin of life in general, in the fossil record anyway, taking me back to the pre-Cambrian in Russia and Siberia and Australia and China too, come to think of it, uh, where we had field trips or expeditions to collect this material was a long-term uh, fascination for me. So there's been a whole life full of fun looking at geology and untangling its mysteries. Sir, there is uh, somebody wants to know more about Stonehenge. Uh, yeah, the stones at Stonehenge have been moved a very long distance uh, from Wales, I believe. And the last time I was at Stonehenge, there was no fence around it or anything. You could walk anywhere you wanted to. And um, that was uh, enlightening because you could actually walk right up to the stone and take a look at it with your hand lens. Uh, of course, I didn't know much about the geology of where they came from, but I followed it ever since then. And they were transported by people pulling them on perhaps rolling logs. It, you know, with a, a few hundred people, it's not a big deal. Sir, there is now an interesting question. What will you advise? There are most of uh, the participants are students doing uh, graduation and post-graduation in geology. So they are curious to know uh, what path they should choose the, in their careers, what they should study. Uh, I think that you should study almost, uh, uh, take a good course in all the different departments of geology, for one thing. A good course in a history of life, in petrology, in uh, sedimentary geology, and get exposed to it all, geochemistry, geophysics, and uh, then think creatively. I think one of our failures in teaching is that we don't teach creativity or vision. And the people that have passion, if they don't have vision and they don't have creativity, passion isn't gonna take them very far. It helps because it focuses you, but you need to do the work of being creative and of having vision of where all of this is going. So you have control of your life and you can take these courses, but it's just the basics. The most useful courses to me was a course I took in typing in high school. I was in a class of 30 people. I was the only boy and I got an F, but that course turned out to be the most useful course I ever took because I type every day. And then I took a course in, uh, biologic illustration where we had to draw pictures of things and it forced me to look at every specimen very carefully in a way that you don't do when you have a scanning electron microscope to study with. That takes a picture and you're done with looking at it and as a result I think people don't see everything in the detail that they need to see it. And then lastly is communication. All the science in the world and all the research that you do is useless if you don't communicate it to other people. And you do that in two or three different ways. One is by speaking like we are speaking tonight, another or today for you. And of course, writing papers about the science. So you need to know how to write and then uh, communicating with um, Social media now is another way to do that. But your science is no good unless you do it and communicate it. And so my last course that I took that was important was a course in scientific writing. And I remember the first day, uh, the assignment was to write about the object on the table. The object on a table was a white 
pool cue ball, sphere of white. And we were supposed to write two pages on it. I don't think anybody wrote for two pages. I mean, there's not much you can say about a, a sphere that's white. We couldn't handle it either, just observe it. So those kinds of things were tools of the trade. And they're very important because you need good tools and you need to remember to use them well, especially the communication part. Speak well, write well, and you will create and have vision. Okay? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Jerry, can you throw some light on Bermuda Triangle? Somebody is asking. Or mysteries in ocean. Um, Hello. I think the Bermuda Triangle is a difficult place to sail. And yeah, there's been a lot of, tra lot of tragedy in that area. But uh, it's tricky to sail there is my estimate. I have not been there myself except on the edge at Bikini and Bermuda. Uh, but there's nothing that I can see in the literature, and I've, I've looked at it a little bit, that um, makes the Bermuda Triangle any more dangerous than just what nature can do. So I think it's natural that these tragedies happen there and people are probably uh, ill-prepared to deal with it. And we do know of some recent tragedies where a freighter went down with a whole bunch of people in uh, a storm and that probably happened a lot, especially before we had uh, communications that we could talk to people while it was happening. That's only been well, relatively recently. So I don't think the Bermuda Triangle is a mystery. We don't have all the answers for why these ships went down, but it's natural. That's my hypothesis. Thank you, Jerry, very much. Uh, so first, I would like to thank Dr. Shailesh Nanak for his inaugural address and also Professor Hello. Jerry Lips for his uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, on, from tomorrow, that is from 11th October to 16th, all the presentations will be in the evening from 6 to 7. Tomorrow, we'll have Dr. Praveen Hendricks, sir, who will be talking about uncommon and and minerals. And with this, I think we conclude this morning session. And tomorrow, from tomorrow, we'll be meeting in the evening from 6 to 7. All the sessions will be in the evening only. And the link and all the information will be given to you on the uh, your email address or your WhatsApp number also. So from we'll meet tomorrow in the evening at 6 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. all of you, too, for your attention. Thank you, Thank you sir. Naik, sir, very much for Thank the you. morning session. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. And I think, Sunil, we can close the session meeting. Yeah.